Bless the Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, you may be seated. Maranatha, the Lord cometh. You're going to see Him sooner than you think. Hallelujah. The Lord Jesus Christ is coming again. And we're going to talk about that today. We're going to share some very pertinent Scriptures that will encourage you, that will bless you. When we talk about the second coming of the Lord Jesus, it's nothing to be frightful of, but something that we look forward to. He's our Lord, He's our Savior, and He is our soon-coming King. Hallelujah. He's coming back. Our world is in a mess, and it's going to get worse. I'm not being negative when I say that. I am giving you factual information. And as the church, we need to come alive. We need to know what the Word of God declares. We need to live for Jesus like we have never lived for Him before. We need to fully surrender our lives to the things of God and to shake off some of the foolishness of the things of this world that has a grip on our hearts. And it's time to surrender those things and get back to Jesus again and to honor Him, and to serve Him, and to follow Him. Like the songwriter says, wherever He will lead, I will follow. It is time to put our will down. And just like Jesus when He declared in the Garden of Gethsemane, not my will, but your will be accomplished. We have been too tied to our will too tied to ourselves and our own purposes, we need to come back to the Word of God again and realize what our Lord and what our Savior has accomplished in our life and to understand that this old world is not our home. We're just passing through. And if you somehow think you're planning to be here for a long time, that is not the case. We're going to leave this old world and we're going to come back and we are going to rule and we're going to reign with the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm looking forward to that day when there'll be no more sorrow, no more tears, no more hurt, no more pain, no more hardship. We will have seen the Father in all of His glory. Praise His wonderful name. I want you to turn with me to the book of Revelation. Notice it doesn't say revelations, revelation, singular, because God has given us all the revelation that we need. Now, He may expound something in a little more detail regarding that revelation to your heart and to your life, but the Bible clearly gives us a warning in the book of Revelation not to add to it and not to take away from it. When we look over history, many have tried to tear some pages out of this book. But this book is more alive today than it has ever been, praise His name. It is alive and it is powerful. It will change your life and it will give you the direction that you need to walk on that straight and narrow path. In fact, when you read through the book of Revelation, in Revelation 1 verse 3, It is the only book in the Bible where there is a promise given to those that read it. And I do understand that sometimes it may seem a little difficult, but with God's help, He will show you very clearly what He is saying. In verse 3, it says, Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep these things which are written therein. For the time is at hand. Underline that in your Bible. The time is at hand. I cannot predict to you the hour or the moment when Jesus will return. The Bible warns us against that. But what it does tells us that we can read the seasons. And I believe that we are in that season where Jesus is about to step over the balcony of glory and He is going to return for the church. Hallelujah. To those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life, 
those that are saved and washed in the blood of the Lamb. He is coming back for a church without spot nor wrinkle. In the early church, the greeting constantly was to one another, Maranatha, the Lord cometh. May we not forget that. May we not try to hide it or put it out of our memory. May we not be discouraged by knowing that He is coming. What am I going to do in this life? Well, we occupy. We serve God. We do everything that we know to do because He is coming back. And we want to be ready and we want to be found in faith as we serve the Lord with all of our heart. He's coming back. I want you to look at Revelation chapter 13 with me as I read this uh, through verse 18. Verses 1 through 18, And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. And upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power." and his seat in great authority. And I saw one of his heads, as it were, wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, which gave great power unto the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given unto over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not, notice that, whose names are not written in the book of life. We won't be here, hallelujah, of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If any man hath an ear, let him hear. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. And I heard another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. And he doth great wonders, so that he maketh fire to come down from heaven, on the earth in the sight of man, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of these miracles which he hath power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image of the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast, that they should be killed. And he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. And that no man might buy or sell, save he that hath the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that understandeth count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred, three score, and six. Six, six, six. Friends, Jesus is coming again. We have this great revelation of how and what will happen and what will take place. We see what will happen to the saints, and we will see what happens to those that will be remaining here on this earth. Let me say categorically, you do not want to be here. You need to be saved. You need to be born again. You need to repent before God. You need to be living right for Jesus. You cannot have one foot in this world and one foot in the kingdom of God. It doesn't work. He'll spew you out of His mouth. 
You need to be living for Jesus. If there's something that's not right in your life, you get it right and you make it right. Because you don't know when Jesus is going to step over that balcony of glory. You don't want to be caught in the middle of your sin. You want to make sure that your life is up to date with God. You see, friends, when Jesus comes again, He's coming once, but He's coming in two stages. He's coming back, church. I want you to get this into your heart. I want you to get it into your spirit. It's broken down into two areas. First is that of the rapture. And the second is what we call the revelation. What do I mean by that? The rapture, He is coming for His saints. The revelation, He's coming back with the saints. It's just like if I took a trip from this pulpit here and I was walking down this aisle and I happened to stand in the middle of that aisle and have a conversation with one of you. So he's coming, as it were, for the saints. He's going to catch us away. He's going to take us to be with himself. Then he's in that midpoint. He's having a conversation. We're going to be having the wonderful marriage supper of the Lamb. And then He is coming back as He continues right down that aisle. And He's coming back with the saints to this earth. Hallelujah. <laughs> Friends, we're not going under. We're going up. And we're going over. Praise God. And you need to be ready for it. You see in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 52, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump for the trumpet shall sound the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed for this corruptible must put on incorruption this mortal must put on immortality so when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written death is swallowed up in victory because he lives we live also praise god we're going to also experience that re resurrection life as we go up with him praise god when he comes back for the rapture of the saints praise god what an exciting day that is going to be there will be a catching away of God's children into the heavenlies, praise God. We're not going right into heaven at that time of the rapture, but we'll be caught up into the heavenlies, praise the Lord. And it'll be wonderful. In Zechariah 14, verse 4, and it says, And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof, towards the east, towards the west. And there shall be a very great valley. And half of the mountain shall remove toward the north, and half of it towards the south. Already scientists have discovered that the Mount of Olives, that there is a crack in it. It's getting ready for the return of the Messiah. Hallelujah. It's getting ready for Jesus to come back again. Praise the Lord. You need to be ready. The rapture, He comes for His saints. The revelation, He comes with the saints. Praise God. We're going to rule and we're going to reign with Him. This time he is coming, and when he comes, he's coming to reveal his full power, his full authority upon this earth. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the beginning and the end. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords, praise God. He is our Savior, and he loves us. He died for us, and he's coming back for the church. He's coming back for you and I, and this will culminate into what is known as the great battle of Armageddon. Let me prepare you. There will be a third world war. There will be a third world war. There'll be skirmishes prior to that. There'll be limited wars, maybe in between. But there will be a major war. And when Jesus comes back, He'll put an end to it. Praise God. He'll put an end to it. In Revelation 13 verse 5, and there was given unto him a mouse speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue for forty and two months. Let me tell you what happens. It's broken into three and a half years and three and a half years. But realize we're not here. Amen. We're not here. The first three and a half years is known as the tribulation period. The second three and a half years is known as the great tribulation period. You don't want to be here. You don't want to be here. 
A lot of times people will say, will the church go through the great tribulation? Let me again categorically state this. It is impossible for the church to go through the tribulation because 90% of the church is already with Jesus. Hallelujah. They're already in his presence. All of the saints that have gone on before us. When the Bible talks about the church, it talks about it in a complete pattern. You're not going to go through the tribulation. Some people talk about pre tribulation, mid-tribulation, post-tribulation. In my 44 years as being a Christian, I've studied the Word of God. I've studied all of the different doctrines pertaining to eschatology and end times. And I want to tell you, the church is going up. We're not going through the tribulation. We may experience tribulation here on this earth with a small t, but nothing as comparison to what it's going to be. If you think that Hitler brought about atrocities on this earth, when the Antichrist comes and rules on this earth, all hell is going to break loose. You do not want to be here. You want to go up. Hallelujah. You want to be in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, what happens is the first three and a half years may seem a little easier, but in the midst of that three and a half years, and I'll talk a little bit more about it towards the end, there is what is known as the abomination of desolation, when a large statue of the Antichrist has been erected and built and brought into the temple in Jerusalem. And what will happen then, Israel will realize their mistake in how that they have sided with the Antichrist. They have made a peace treaty with him. But all hell will then break loose. Oh, friends, these are some of the things that are going to happen here on this earth. And that, of course, was spoken by Daniel, the prophet. And you can read it in Matthew 24, 15. When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, who readeth, let him understand. Because the Antichrist will fully reveal himself for who he is. The demon that is inside of him as he is there serving fully the devil with all of the devil's power. Let me say this, the first coming of Christ. He was born like a little baby. Little baby in Bethlehem to over 2,000 years ago. There are over 300 specific predictions relating to the first coming of the Messiah. But let me declare this. There are twice as many prophecies regarding His second coming as there was pertaining to His first coming. In the New Testament alone, on an average, there are at least one in 20 verses speaking towards the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to be prepared. We need to be ready. Look how God completely orchestrates things. When you think of him being born in Bethlehem, Judea, at least 80 miles away from Nazareth, a three days journey. Caesar Augustus made a decree that the world would be taxed, the census would be taken, all to make sure that this little baby would be born. Hallelujah. Oh, friends, what an amazing God we serve. In Luke 2, verse 1, And it came to pass in those days there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Serenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, every one into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea, onto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David. Almost, in almost 3,000 years of history, there's only been 300 years of world peace. But because of Romans leadership and building roads and the Greek language and the world being Hellenized, the gospel was able to be preached further and faster than ever before. Why am I saying these things? Because God knows what he's doing. And if these prophecies are being fulfilled, then the second coming of Christ will be even more so fulfilled. Hallelujah. In Genesis 12, verse 1 through 3, 
Way back there to Abraham. Now the Lord said unto Abraham, Get thee out of thy country, from thy kindred, from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation. And I will bless thee. And I will make thy name great. And I shall be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curses him that curse thee. And in thee shall all of the families of the earth be blessed. Not only was this speaking regarding Abraham, but also it was a four shadow of the Lord Jesus Christ and who He is and what He was going to do and the wonderful blessings that He would bring into our lives. And that's why we should be following Him and serving Him. In Genesis 49, 10, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between His feet. Unto Shiloh come, and unto Him shall the gathering of the people be. That term Shiloh just simply is relating to the Messiah until He comes. He's coming back. He came the first time, and He's coming back a second time. Praise the Lord. Many within Israel are still awaiting His first coming. They missed the first coming. How sad to say they missed the first coming. But praise God, he's coming back again. When it talks about Shiloh, that's where the tabernacle was received. It was its permanent home. It's where there was worship that went up and went forth. And when it talks about Jesus, it's talking about how we're to honor him and to worship him and respect him and to love him with all of our heart, praise God. And then they lost, as it were, the Ark of the Covenant to the Philistines, and then it came back again into that place of worship. You see, these are all little reminders how that Jesus is temporarily gone, but He is coming back again. You see, God's covenant with David shows that not only would He be from Judah, but He would be from the very family of David. Again, I'm trying to get it into your heart. These things were all fulfilled. History proves it, shows it, tells it, speaks of it. Regarding His first coming, who He would be, what He would do. And I share these to let you know He's coming back. 1 Chronicles 17, 11, It shall come to pass, when thy days be expired, that thou must go to be with thy fathers, that I will raise up thy seed after thee, which shall be of thy sons, and I will establish His kingdom. He shall build me a house. And I will establish his throne forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. And I will not take my mercy away from him, as I look, as I took it from him that was before thee. Again, showing that through the lineage of David, a Messiah was going to come forth. That's why in Micah 5 verse 2, But thy Bethlehem Ephratah, Though thy be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. God has always been. I can't explain God to you. I just know he's there. I like to put it this way. I feel the furniture moving on the inside of my life. Hallelujah. I know he's real. I know he's powerful. I've seen his hand at work. And one day, we will see Him in all of His glory. Hallelujah. In Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, time does not allow me to read it all, but it shows that the Jewish people would return from their Babylonian captivity, and they would return back to Israel. In droves, they're returning back to Israel. They're getting ready for something. They don't always understand what it is, but it's because Christ is going to return again. God has prepared all of these things. In Isaiah 35, verses 4 through 6, we we have the prophecy regarding His ministry and what Jesus would do while He was here on His first coming. And in Isaiah 35, verse 4, it says, Say to them, they're of a fearful heart, be strong. God's saying that to you and I today. Fear not, behold, your God will come. He will come with vengeance, even God with the recompense. He will come and He will save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as the heart and the tongue of the dumb sing, for in the wilderness shall waters break out and streams in the desert. What an incredible promise regarding to the first coming of the Lord and to His ministry. And you remember John the Baptist when he was in prison? 
said to his disciples, is this Jesus? We're not sure if he was discouraged or what was going on or what was happening while he was in that dungeon, but, but the disciples went and they got a hold of Jesus and, and Jesus said this to them in Matthew 11 verse 4, fulfilling the prophecy of Isaiah 35 4. Go show John again these things which you do hear and see. The blind receive their sight. The lame walk. The lepers are cleansed. The deaf hear. The dead are raised up. The poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who is not offended in me. I want you to underline that in your Bible. Because church, you're going to be challenged. There will be a sifting. There will be a shaking. Because the enemy is at war with you and I in the faith in which we believe. He will do everything possible and is doing everything possible. As you heard a message from Pastor Brian last week, in that of distraction within our lives, and you have to be so cautious and careful. There's so many things that will draw us away from the purposes and plans that God has us. But I'm glad that Jesus said He came to do His Father's will. May we too do the Father's will. May we too serve the Master with all of our heart, with all of the strength that's in our very being. He did incredible miracles. Isaiah 52 shows of his suffering, verses 13 to 14. Isaiah 53, verses 1 through 3, shows of his rejection. Isaiah 53, 9, and he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death because he had done no violence. Neither was any deceit in his mouth. Again, showing that all of these things pertaining to his first coming were fulfilled just like he said it would right through the lineage from Abraham, right through to David, to Jesus being born in Bethlehem. And as I 53, 12, therefore will I divide him a portion with the great. He shall divide the spoil with the strong because he hath poured out his soul unto death. He was numbered with the transgressors and he bare the sin of many and he made intercession for the transgressors. While he was hanging on Calvary, two thieves on either side, others on the floor, reel, reeling him, throwing accusations. If you be the Christ, come down, take yourself of the cross. Thank God there was one thief that said to the other, be quiet. He said, Jesus, remember me when I come in, when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, this day shall you be with me in paradise. And then he cried out in Luke 23, 34, as he looked at those that caused him to suffer, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Precious one, he died for you. He died for me. Live right for Jesus. I can't emphasize it enough. Live right for Jesus. Come on. It's time to become real. It's time to be a real Christian. Hallelujah. It's time to serve Jesus. You see, friends, he's coming again, and we shall see the king in his beauty. As the song says, just one glimpse of him in glory will the toils of life repay. 1 Corinthians 15, 53, when this corruption puts on incorruption, this mortal put on immortality, mine eyes shall see the king in his glory. What a day that will be. The king's coming. We're going to be changed. No more pain and this old body, no more growing old. We're going to put cosmetics out of business. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He's coming. We're going to be changed. You know, a lot of times you'll get criticism for being a Christian, for trying to do your best, for trying to do something for the kingdom. It's all right. They persecuted Jesus. You'll get persecuted as well. But for us, we're going up. I always love what D.L. Moody said, you know, to those who would criticize him and point the finger. He says, I like the way I'm doing it better than the way you're not. Do something for Jesus. You may not be perfect at it, but do whatever you can for the Master and serve Him. You see, when He comes the second time, church, suddenly, like a thief in the night, with a shout, with a trumpet blast... 1 Thessalonians 5, 2, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. That's why I'm saying, keep up the date accounts with God. Live every day as if he's coming back today, every moment. 
Do you know that when the message of the second coming is preached, that people by and large live closer to God than they've ever done before? But few places preach it, but you're starting to see it coming back in again. Because we're getting closer, people are starting to see that the clock is ticking and the time is near. 2 Peter 3.10, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. What does it mean by that? It's a thief in the night, as it were, in the sense that we need to be prepared. To the world, they won't understand it. To the world, they won't hear it. But you and I will hear that shout, and we'll hear that trumpet sound. And the dead shall rise to meet him in the air. Those that have gone on before is reunited with their body and caught up together with us in the air. Hallelujah. The graves will open. There'll be a shake and an earthquake like people have never seen it before. And spirits reunited with those that have gone on before. Because you see, 1 Corinthians 15, 52, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, the last trump, the trumpet shall sound. The dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. Hallelujah. Perfect body. Hallelujah. Changed. What is a blink of an eye? Blink of an eye takes 300 to 400 milliseconds. Since there's a thousand milliseconds in each second, a blink of an eye takes around one third of a second compared to the time span of one full second. Have you got all of that? Buy the tape and you'll get that. <laughs> That's fast. That quick. Even if you watch a, a, a rocket going up, it still takes time to get right up there through the atmosphere. Blink of an eye, we're in the presence of God. Now I've got a little deal with God. Have you ever made a little deals with God? You ever watch one of those, you know, uh, movies and they do a replay of everything in slow motion? I'm saying, Lord, even though I'm there in the twinkle of an eye, let me just see it in slow motion as I'm going up. As we go up, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. When the second coming is realized, I want to live for Jesus. Amen. What's the first thing to happen when we go up? You need to know what's going to happen. Because this will help you to live right for Jesus. It's called the judgment seat of Christ. We're in the heavenlies also known as the Bema. This is where the believers will be judged. You and I are going to be judged, but it, it must not be confused with the great white throne judgment. We'll talk about it in another message that comes more than 1,000 years later and is strictly for the unsaved where they will get their marching orders into their lost eternity. But the believer's judgment is for what we have done here on the earth. Yes, you're going to get in. You're going to be in the presence of God. But we will be judged as, why did we not use that gifting? Why did we not give of that in that offering? Why did we not help that individual? Why did we not make a difference? Why were we so taken up with the things of the world instead of being taken up with the things of God? Why were we watching something foolish on TV when we should have been in a prayer meeting, praying through for a world to get saved? Oh, this is challenging. It's poignant, but we need to hear it. You see, in 2 Corinthians 5, 7, for we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body, to be present with the Lord. Wherefore, we labor. Say labor. Whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Friends, if you have unforgiveness in your heart, you let it go. You know, one of the sad things is we just need to be getting on with God's business. You know, too many people fall out over the most silliest things that hinders the work of God instead of advancing the work of God. Make sure your heart and your motive is always right before the Lord. That it's just not some kind of selfish ambition, 
but that you are filled with a desire to serve Jesus and to give of your all and you don't care who gets the glory as long as you're not seeking that glory. Because he's worth all of the glory. Amen? I'm a great believer. If somebody's doing something better than you're doing it, pat them on the back. Hallelujah. And thank God for them. And thank God for them. Praise the Lord. But we will be judged. See, in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 9, for we are, here it is again, laborers together with God. You are God's husbandry. You are God's building. See, we don't belong to ourselves. What we have is God-given. But it wasn't for God, none of us would be here. Very air that we breathe. According to the grace of God which is given unto me, a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, another buildeth thereon, but let every man take heed how he buildeth thereon. For other foundations can no man lay that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon the foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. Even though we're in his presence, we will be judged. You know why? The Bible says he's a righteous judge. Don't think that people are going to get off with stuff. No, we will be judged. We're in His presence. But let's do the best that we can as we serve Him and as we honor Him and as we rejoice in the Lord. But what's the second thing that's going to happen? So here we are. We are being judged. But the second thing is we're enjoying the marriage supper of the Lamb. Boy, Christians love to feast. We're going to have fellowship. We're going to be in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to be sitting around that table with millions upon millions of believers joined together, rejoicing in the presence of the Lord. We're going to look forward to that. But what's going on on earth? You see, the prince of the power of the air will set up what is known as an unholy trinity. The devil has always tried to imitate God, to imitate the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Revelation 13, we've read about how it's going to come into play as he is, when we go into the heavenlies, he's kicked here onto this earth. As I mentioned earlier, if you think things are bad now, I'm telling you, it's going to escalate. You don't want to be here. You see, we have the unholy trinity. How's it broken down? The dragon, which is the devil. The first beast, which is the Antichrist, whose number is 666, or also known as the man of sin. The third, or the second beast, is known as the false prophet. See, people have always had a form of religion, but denying the power thereof. The old devil will give people as much religion as they want, but don't mention the name Jesus. You know, even after the rapture of churches, there'll still be people in it. Now, some people will come to the point of experience Christ during the tribulation period, but they'll pay a price for that. As I've said, you don't want to be here. Look at some of the churches today. I mean, we're hearing less and less of the Word of God being proclaimed. Many of our churches shall not even hear speaking in tongues anymore, the power of the Holy Spirit in operation. There are churches within Toronto today that are literally worshiping the devil today. Not worshiping Jesus, but the devil, Satan churches. That's going on. We see how the enemy is trying to infiltrate in every way. But you see, when that Antichrist comes, he won't come with two horns sticking out of his head, big nose, and a pitchfork, as we all have been led to believe. No, let me tell you a little bit about this Antichrist. He'll be a brilliant statesman. Fantastic political leader. He will be a genius. He will be the head of the European nations. Presently, there are 28 European nations. It'll be reduced down to 10, bringing about the old Babylonian Roman Empire kingdom again and setting that up. He will come out of that. It's not Obama. 
I, I, I just want some of you to know that, all right? Uh, I mean, a little while back there, there was a lot of people saying that's who it was going to be. No, he, he will come out of the European Union. It's by no accident that Britain, because of the Brexit, has come out of Europe. That will set a precedent and allow many of the other nations to come out, and many of the other ones will be cut down, and it'll be reduced to 10. He will come out of that. He will set up a one-world government. He will bring about a financial and economic miracle. Friends, I'm going to say some things here, and as I say it, we're men and women of faith, so we don't need to be fearful. We are in for a financial collapse like you have never, ever seen before. Since the 1700s right up to the 21st century, there have been over 58 financial crashes, economic crises that have taken place. And I don't say that to be fearful. I say that for you to be prepared. If you are in debt, get out of it as fast as you can. Have what is called and what is known as minimal debt. Only the debt that you need, that you can manage. But don't go above your head. Young people, manage that credit card. The banks are so quickly to give it to you. One of the things that bugged me when I first came to Canada, nobody wanted cash. It was like, oh, you don't have any credit. So to get credit, you've got to get into debt. See how the system works. Who would have ever thought that the United States of America would be in debt to China? Notice the setup. Because China, Russia will be two of the main players during that time when the church is taken up. We see everything coming into play through those nations right now. I mean, Putin's on a rampage. America's hamstrung. But Jesus is in control. Hallelujah. See, that's the balance right there. A lot of people say to me, Pastor, why are you wanting to get rid of the dead in the church? I want to get ready so that we can just be dealing with the lives of people that are going to be hurting. People are going to come in here that don't know Jesus. Broken, hurt, destitute. Who would ever thought that an average house now in Toronto is nearly $1.3 million? How does a young couple carry anything like that? How does a young couple carry most of the houses in Brampton that's nearly $700,000, $750,000? There's a breaking point. And somehow this Antichrist will come and solve all of those problems. So if he's going to solve that economic promise problem, then it shows there is an economic problem. And we need to be ready, and we need to be prepared he will make a seven-year treaty with Israel. Look how often the various treaties have failed because the timing's not right yet. But he will set up a seven-year treaty with Israel. He will give them a form of godliness. One of the big things right now is what was created a number of years ago is the ecumenical movement. You know, everybody come together. Everybody think the same. Water down the gospel. Look how much the gospel has been watered down. You go to some churches today, and most people go to hear the latest joke. No, I'm, I go to church, I don't want to hear the latest joke. I want to hear the, the latest word from God. I can listen to jokes at other times when I want to come into the house of God. I want to hear what Jesus has to say to my heart, what Jesus has to say to my spirit. 20-minute sermons are made for 20-minute people. No, we want the Word of God. We want to know what we're standing on, what we believe. Jesus is coming back again. And I'm telling you, there'll be a lot of surprises as to who goes into the heavenlies and who's not. You be ready. You be ready. See, 2 Timothy 3, 5 says, having a form of godliness, denying the power thereof. It says, turn away from it. Turn away from it. You'll go into churches and they'll say, now, let's not, look, let's not look at the Bible. Just listen to what I'm saying. If they're just saying, listen to what I'm saying, leave that church. No, I want to make sure they're saying it from the Word of God. Not their opinion, but what God's opinion is. That's what counts. We need more of the Word of God. More of the Word of God. 
Because it says in Revelation 13, 3, as we read it, the whole world wondered after the beast, after the Antichrist. They were in awe, fixed everything. Problems of the world are solved. But understand, we're not here if you're a believer. Your name's written in the last book. You're not here. You're gone. You're gone. We need to certainly pray for those that are suffering persecution even in greater manners than we are. But the persecution that will finally come on this earth in the middle of that three and a half years will really be extreme. See, 2 Timothy 4, verse 3. Listen to what it says here. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they will turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned on to fables. I want to tell you some good news. See the preachers in this church? They won't preach fables. They'll preach the Word of God. Hallelujah. We're not going to tell you what you want to hear. We'll tell you what you need to hear. Amen. That's why God has put us in places of leadership because there's something in our heart. There's something in our spirit. We know what we're talking about. We've lived it. We've walked it. We know what we're saying. I don't know if you've got a saying here, but you have one in Ireland. Don't tell your dad how to suck eggs. Some of you have heard it. We know what we're talking about. We need more of the Word of God. One day this Antichrist, notice him. See, the devil always imitating God. One day the Antichrist will be addressing a Christ. Suddenly in the middle, somebody, we don't know what it will be. The Bible talks about a sword using that time's terminology. Don't know if it's a weapon or whatever it will be, but he will be killed. The devil, the dragon will reach into hell and take an even greater demon and, and put it into the Antichrist and he will come back to life again, imitating the death, burial, resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. The world will wonder how wonderful this man is. They'll be taken in by it. But you see, all eyes will be watching. See, many years ago, that couldn't be the case. You know, the early days... It was smoke signals. Telegram. Letters. Telephone. Now we've got a thing called the internet. Every eye will see it. You watch the news now, you see something that's happened instantaneously right there in front of your very eyes. The camera will be on them and they'll see them resurrected, coming back to life again. Then the false prophet imitating Elijah, calling fire down literally from heaven. Deceiving, deception of the people. And then this false prophet gives instruction to build a large image of the Antichrist and then commands the statue to speak. Scientists have been trying forever to get inanimate objects to speak. They haven't been able to do it. But here, this object will start to speak. <clears throat> and commands that the people are to worship the image. Here's a, a supernatural act taking place. Sad part is the church, because of sometimes reading this, don't want to get involved in the supernatural. But friends, the only way to defeat the supernatural is to be supernatural. Because our God is greater. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Thank God for the supernatural power of God. You know, you don't set something aside because there's misuse. There's balance. And let me tell you, in this church, we got balance. Because you got me. Under him. Hallelujah. You can't pull the wool over these eyes. But what happens in the middle of the three and a half years is this statue. The temple in Jerusalem will have been rebuilt. We just had a wonderful celebration for Israel there a few weeks ago. I was talking to one of the rabbis. I mean, the red heifers in place. 
uh, many of the anointing oils are all in place. All they have to do is rebuild the temple. We don't know how that's going to come about. Will it be started before we're taken up? Will it happen during the time that we're up there? That I can't tell you. But what will happen? The temple will have been rebuilt. They'll bring this statue in. And then it will be worship the statue. Worship the Antichrist. Then that's when Israel will realize they've been deceived in signing that seven-year treaty. 42 months, 42 months. Three and a half, three and a half. They won't do it. It says they'll be hunted to the hills. They'll be hunted to the hills. There's a similar story that again gives light to this in Daniel 3.1. You remember Nebuchadnezzar, the king made an image of gold, whose height was three score cubits, the breadth threw off six cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura, in the province of Babylon. So it just shone right across the valley. Again, preparing us for what lies ahead. You see, that second three and a half years is also known as what is called Jacob's Trouble. In 1935, doctor, a man called Dr. Blackstone had a revelation from the Lord. And what he did was, because of these scriptures and similar scriptures that I'm reading, was he got these little copper boxes and he, and he put Bibles in them. And he's gone throughout the hills of Israel. And he's placed these little copper boxes for a time when the children of Israel will head to the hills. And scriptures pertaining to the Messiah so that they can be blessed. What next? We're nearly through. The Antichrist will have a popularity test because he sees that the children of Israel aren't following him. There are, are, are those that have realized that their loved ones have gone up and and they have understood that what we were saying was true. And here they are. If you've ever seen the Left Behind series. They will make things right with God. But they will be hunted. They will lose their life. And so the Antichrist will have this popularity attest. Who's for me? Who's against me? And he causes the people to take a mark. Now again, many years ago. When this message was preached. You know. People can only see the number 666 stuck on a forehead or on their forehand. And yet we've been conditioned for those kinds of things. Look at tattooing today. I mean, it's so readily accepted. Could be a system to choose. Could be. Uh, go to Canada's Wonderland. I haven't been for a while, but I know when my kids were smaller, what they did was stick out your hand, you got a stamp on it. Go to Disney, it was the same thing. Preconditioned so that when the Antichrist comes, oh, just stick out your hand. It's just a little mark. But it's so much easier today because we've got credit cards. We've got a little thing called the microchip. Most of you that have got pets, your dog's microchipped. Your cat's microchipped. Your gerbil, well, no, not your gerbil. <coughs> But if you don't have that mark, he'll know, and those around, and you'll be killed. Now, my prayer is that you're already up with the Lord Jesus Christ. But if for some reason you're still stubborn enough and want to be here, and we're out of here, don't take the mark. In whatever form, don't take it. Don't take it. Because... If you do, it's all over for you. It's a lost eternity. It's better to die and lose, as it were, your life by holding on to Him than taking that mark. You may have property that's worth dear knows what. You know, you're trying to run away because you realize how hard and how bad things are. Because you've got to realize the Spirit of God's been removed. All hell's broke loose. I'm not sure which way people are going to come to know Jesus. You know, it will probably be somewhat similar to the Old Testament. But the fact is, we know that people will make a decision for God during that time frame. You won't be able to buy. You won't be able to sell. You go to the store, try to buy groceries for your children. And the clerk says, uh, put out your hand. 
put it out. No mark. No microchip. Can't do it. Because if she sells you, she's going to lose her life. If they deal with you at all, they will lose their life. But friends, realize as Christians, we're enjoying the married supper of the Lamb. We're having a banquet. We're in the presence of Jesus. We're not here. We're not here. We're not here. While all that's going on, there's a build-up. There's a build-up to the battle of Armageddon. You don't want to be around during the tribulation period. In closing, I'm reminded of the story of a young couple. Just recently had gotten engaged and they were invited to a church service. Made their way to the church service or sitting close to the back. The message was preached and the heart of the young girl was stirred. The message was poignant and strong and God was touching her by his spirit. And she turned around to the young man and said, look, when the altar call was given, I'm going to go and give my life to Jesus. Would you come up with me? Will you come up with me? I'm going to give my life to Jesus. And, and he said, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not going up. I'm not going to give my life to Jesus. The young woman stood up. Tears in her eyes. She looked at the young man. This was her words. She said, if you're not going to go to heaven with me, I'm not going to go to hell with you. Friends, make sure you're up to date with God. Serve the Lord with your hands. He's coming soon. He's coming back. Live for Jesus. Would you bow your head in prayer with me? I've given you a lot of information here. Next week we'll talk a little more of the Mark of the Beast, the Battle of Armageddon, the two witnesses. Week after, we'll speak on the millennium reign, the great white throne judgment, the two resurrections. And the final week, new heavens, new earth, the new Jerusalem. But do you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Where are you with God? I'm not trying to use scare tactics here. I'm just giving you the word of God from the book of Revelation as to what is in our future. And we need to be ready. You need to be ready. I remember at the opening of our building here, we had a little video. People get ready. There's a train a-coming. Jesus is coming. While heads are bowed in prayer, if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, or you know that if he was to come today, what if you knew that Jesus was coming at 12 noon? Boy, I'm telling you, you'd put everything in order, wouldn't you? We don't know what exact time he's coming, but we do need to be ready. We don't want to be left behind. Remember the story of the ten virgins? Five ready, five not. Bridegroom cometh. Five were unprepared. You need to be prepared. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, would you put your hand up right now? Everyone else is bowed in prayer. Just put it right up so we can see it. Yes, yes. Other others? This is your moment of decision. Thank God that so many are living for Jesus. Those of you that raised your hand, pray this prayer with me right now. And then when I dismiss the service, I want you just to come up and join me here at the front. Just say, Dear Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. You are who you say you are. You can do the things that you say that you can do. I need you as my Savior. I want to live right. I want to do right. I want to follow you. And when you return, I want to be one that goes up with you. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Come in today. Come in to stay. And Lord, for others, holding resentments on forgiveness, fears, doubt, sickness, disease, all of these things that this beast would try 
bring upon us this dragon, the devil, try to hurt us. False religions are so prominent in our world today, denying the power of Jesus. Father, forgive us, touch us, heal us, strengthen us. Help us to be more aware and alive to you and to your word than we've ever been. And to our purpose here on this earth that what matters above everything else is you in our life. Help us always to honor that as we serve you. Now bless your people, Father God, as they leave this place today with a profound sense of knowing who you are and a knowing of what lies ahead in the days in which we live. That, Lord, that we will not be blindsided, but we're fully aware of what's going on around us in these days in which we live. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for being with us today. Next week, come back for more of the same. If you need further prayer in any manner, those that raise their hand to accept Jesus, please come and see me at the front. We have some literature that we want to give to you that will be of help to you in your walk with God. Thanks for being with us today. Be back again this evening. Pastor Monica will be again opening up the bread of life. Have a wonderful afternoon. God richly bless you.